morning excited to start a new sermon series. We spent uh, in the fall slow walking our way through Jesus' teaching in the Beatitudes, which opens up his Sermon on the Mount. And I don't know if I said in here, I can't remember where I said what in which service, but the reason, uh, the impetus to do that series in the fall was a number of conversations that I was having for about six, uh, sorry, nine months to a year or so uh, with Pastor Alberta before he passed. And for those that are new who don't know him, Pastor Alberta was a senior pastor here at this church for about 30 years, and he recently went to see the Lord. And in conversations with Pastor Alberta, he and I would meet regularly and have wonderful conversations of life and faith and leadership. And, uh, but one of the conversations that he would often bring up, or one thing he wanted to talk about quite a bit, he would say, Chris, I've been in ministry uh, here for about 25, 30 years, ministry itself for 40 or so years, and I feel like I'm asking myself a new, uh, this question. What does it mean to be a for real Christian? What does it mean to be for real? I, I feel like I'm just asking myself again and again, what does it mean? I want to be for real. Of course, I don't want a skin deep, surface level. I know that no one here wants that. I, I don't want that. What does it mean to be for real? And when we would have those conversations, the place that we would go to, uh, he would go to, and I just mostly listen, would be Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Again and again and again, it was the Sermon on the Mount. And if you were following him, uh, on his blog before he passed, that was one of the places that he would go to uh, most regularly was the Sermon on the Mount. And so honoring him and just those questions also wrestling in my mind as we had those conversations, we went to the Beatitudes. And so the question is, where do you go next, right? Because that series has come to a close and, and uh, this is a pretty thick book. <laughs> and we're coming into Advent, uh, leading into Christmas, and so well, the typical thing to do would be to put together an Advent series that would have a number of messages that lead very naturally into Christmas. And that makes a lot of sense, and it's a good thing. And I actually had put one together. I had it all set, and it was, it was great, and I was all set to go. But just wasn't settled in that. And continued to seek the Lord and just to be praying, because at least for me, when I'm unsettled, I'm saying, okay, the Lord's, the Lord's unsettling me. And through the process of time and prayer, just felt like God was saying, Keep going to not stop and to continue to ask Pastor Alberta's question, what does it mean to be for real? And to, Lord willing, continue through the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6, and 7. And the Holy Spirit has control and the Holy Spirit can do whatever the Holy Spirit wants. But Lord willing, that's what we're going to do. To ask the question, what does it mean to be for real? And so as we left last week, Matt led us through Jesus' teaching that we are the salt of the earth and that we are the light of the world. And today we're going to continue with Jesus asking, or Jesus' statement saying, I did not come to abolish the law of the prophets, but I came to fulfill them. So I invite you to stand with me. And we stand to honor God's word. And it's reading as we read Matthew 5. Verses 17 through 20. Jesus says, Do not think I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish them. I came to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you for these words that you have given to us by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we pray you would be here now in this place and in our hearts. We pray that this text would not be a dead letter, but that your Holy Spirit would attend this word 
to bring it to life in our hearts. We pray we would not be the foolish person who hears these words, just as we've read them. Hears them and does not do them. Those building our house upon the sand, but to be the wise person who hears these words in this reading and enabled by the Holy Spirit, does them. Those building our house upon the rock. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of our sermon series, as we ex- continue to journey through the Sermon on the Mount, through the end of chapter 5, is From the Heart. That we are going to be asking the question today and in the coming weeks, what does it mean to follow God from the heart? And perhaps when you read this passage and the remainder of chapter 5, you might ask, well, that's kind of maybe an interesting title for a series when I look through what Jesus teaches us here. But I hope that by the end of today, that it will make more sense for what we are going to be journeying through in the coming weeks. Jesus came to say that I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill them. And what I hope that we see today is that Jesus is the faithful servant through whom the covenant is fulfilled and humanity is renewed. And if you're new this morning or maybe newer to the faith or for any number of reasons, there may be some words on there that you might have some questions about. What does it mean, faithful servant? What is this word covenant? What does that mean? What is a covenant and why is he using that word? What does it mean that humanity is renewed? So I hope that by the end of today, these things are more clear. And I invite you, even as today and in future messages, there's anything like a word like that. What does this mean? To write it down and to be able to explore that. There are so many resources available. But today, I hope that we can see that Jesus is the faithful servant through whom the covenant is fulfilled and humanity is renewed. And again, we begin by looking at verse 17 where Jesus, as we said, says, I did not come to abolish, as he calls, the law of the prophets. I didn't come to set aside the law of the prophets. And when these words are put together, what Jesus is referencing is the entirety of what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. Jesus is not saying, I am here to establish a new religion. I'm here to set aside all that has come before to start something new where we're taking everything before and placing it on a shelf. We are not here to do, as some people will tell us nowadays, to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. But that Jesus is firmly planted in the Hebrew Scriptures. I did not come to set them aside. I came to fulfill them. And the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets are many things. The Old Testament contains law. The Old Testament contains wisdom literature. The Old Testament contains poetry. The Old Testament contains prophetic literature. But what the Old Testament is, by and large, is a narrative. It is a story. And it's the story that the Old Testament tells that provides coherence and context for all the other elements of it. To understand properly how to interpret its poetry, its laws, its wisdom, and its prophecy, you must understand its story. Without its story, you will not properly understand its other parts. And Jesus is saying, I am here to fulfill and complete that story. It's like if you're at home and you're going to watch uh, on Netflix a show. And if you watch a show on Netflix or whatever streaming service it is that you happen to be watching, shows are usually organized by different episodes. And episodes uh, are organized into seasons. And each episode is a, a kind of a coherent story in of itself. You can usually open up each episode and there's a kind of a beginning and a middle of an end to that episode. But the episode at the end of that episode, there's enough of a cliffhanger to want or to entice you to watch the next show. And that episode two is, again, another kind of story that leads you to watch episode three and so forth. Now, the entirety of the season 
There's a story that unites all these episodes together, and each episode is not totally independent. It's, it's a part of an overarching story that this show is telling you that each episode plays a part. And usually at the end of a season, there is a, a, a sort of a, a, an episode that ties up a lot of the loose ends of that entire season, what it, that season has been telling. There's, it ties up a lot of loose ends, so you feel like, oh, I, I, I feel like I'm getting answers to a lot of what this story is about. But at the end of the episode, at the end of the season, there's going to be, if they're doing a good job, a tremendous cliffhanger. Why? So that you watch season two. And the Old Testament is that. The Old Testament has lots of different episodes that comprise the Old Testament. And each one of these episodes makes sense. They're stories that they tell. But in order to understand what these stories are telling in the Old Testament, you must understand the entire season. You must understand the entire, the, the, the structure of the story. But at the end of the season, there's a tremendous cliffhanger. And if you're a Jew who understands this story, you're pulling your hair out to see how the story ends. And Jesus says, that's me. I'm how this story ends. And if we're going to understand what Jesus means, even if it's in brief, we must tell the story. We must tell the story to understand how Jesus is the fulfillment of it. And it's, and it's inevitably the case when you try to summarize 1,000 pages in about five minutes, you're not going to do justice to that story. So forgive me where what the story I'm about to tell does not do justice to the entirety of it, but I hope to tell it in a way that makes sense Jesus' words. And this story begins where the Bible begins, back in creation, where God makes all the world, heavens and the earth, in six days, filling it with life. And on the sixth day, God creates a very special creature. It's called a human being. And God creates human beings and says this, you human beings are going to be my partners. And my good purposes for my world that I've made are going to go forward through you. My good purposes for my creation are going to go forward through you. You will rule the earth, the Bible says, over the birds of the sky, over the fish in the seas, and over every creeping thing along the ground. God is king, make no mistake. But God is king, says that I am going to exercise my kingship over the earth through my human partners. What a tremendous, by the way, privilege to be a human being. And do those human beings who God says, I'm going to partner with you to my good purposes to go forward into my creation through you, do those human beings prove to be faithful covenant partners with God? No. They rebel. And they say, yes, God has created me to be a partner with him, to see his good purposes to go forward in the world through me, but I think I have my own agenda, I have my own way and my own plan. And they rebel, and that breaks the heart of God. It breaks his heart. In fact, that's exactly what the Bible says in Genesis 6. When he looks down to see all that has happened on the earth, it says that his heart is broken. And over the early chapters of Genesis into chapters 11, into chapter 11 of Genesis, all of humanity gathers together in one project of rebellion to build a tower to make a name for themselves over and against God. And God comes down from the heavens to see their tiny little tower. In fact, if you understand the Hebrew, it's pretty funny. It's a joke. God's like, oh, here's your little tower. Nice job. Very threatening. <laughs> but God, in judgment of his human creatures, disperses them and confuses their language. And out of that chaos and out of that corruption, God calls one man in Genesis 12. And his name is Abraham, the father of Israel. And he says, Abraham, you and your family are going to be my partner, just like Adam. 
And my good purposes for my world are going to go forward through you and through your family. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to multiply you as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. And I will bless you so that you will be a blessing to the world. In other words, my good purposes for my creation are going forward through you, Abraham. It says Abraham believes him has faith in those promises, and that it is credited to him as righteousness. And we read in Genesis 22 a tremendous act of obedience by Abraham, where God goes to Abraham and tells him, I want you to take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and I want you to take him on top of Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. Does that make a lot of sense to you? If you were Abraham, is that a command that you want to receive from God? But what does Abraham do? He listens to the voice of God. And he takes his son Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah, places him upon the altar, and raises the knife over his body. And as Abraham brings the knife down to strike his son, the voice of God says, Stop. And here's what God says. Because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, as the sands of the seashore. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the world be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. That when God's partner, Abraham, obeys the voice of God, there is an epicenter of blessing that expands out from him into all the world. And then his family progresses forward through Isaac and then Jacob, and they are down in Egypt where God fulfills his promises that they become a mighty nation, and for 400 years they are multiplied and become a great family and nation. But there becomes a Pharaoh who oppresses them and enslaves them. And it says that God remembers his partnership. He remembers his covenants and he remembers his promises to Abraham. And he comes to deliver this nation with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. And he brings them out into the desert in the wilderness to Mount Sinai where he meets with his people. And his presence descends upon a mountain. And here's what God tells them. Israel, you are going to be my partner. Just like he told Adam and just like he told Abraham. You are going to be my partner. And my good purposes for my world are going to go forward through you. Just like he told Adam and just like he told Abraham. I will bless you to such an extent that you will not be able to take it. I'm going to bring you into a good land. You are going to be a light to the nations. You will mediate all of my blessings to them as a kingdom of priests. If you listen to my voice. You know that in Hebrew there is no Hebrew word for obey. There is only the Hebrew word listen, which is translated obey. If you will listen to my voice, like your father Abraham did, then I will bless you. I will bless you beyond your belief. But if you do not listen to my voice, I cannot bless you. You know, at Sinai, the the, the Bible understands what happens at Mount Sinai with Moses and the people of Israel in two primary metaphors. Those primary metaphors is one, the metaphor of marriage. And the other one is the metaphor of adoption. In Hosea 11, verse 1, it says, Out of Israel I called my son. That the nation of Israel is a firstborn son to God and adopted at Mount Sinai. But also, he says, I was a husband to you and I married you in the wilderness. And this metaphor of marriage between the Israelites and God. And what God says is, if you will be to me a faithful wife, I will bless you. If you will be to me a faithful son, I will bless you. But if not, I cannot bless you. Many of us here are parents. 
Or if you're not a parent yet, or maybe if you're a child, you can imagine being a parent. Maybe. <laughs> For those of us who are parents, when your child was disobedient, or is disobedient, do you respond by blessing them in their disobedience? <coughs> How about this? If you're a responsible parent, <laughs> do you reward disobedience? You do not. In fact, what do you do if you're a responsible parent? <laughs> You've been over to my house? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> uh, somewhat true, huh? You uh, discipline your child. Now, that discipline may look different for each family, of course, but you respond with waywardness of a child with discipline. Why? Because you love your child. And you discipline them because you want to turn them from their waywardness to be on the straight and narrow path of righteousness, right? You want them to do what's right because it's the, it's the path of doing what's right that leads to blessing. And God loves us. God loves you. He loves Israel. He says, if, if I'm going to bless you and you're my adopted son, you must listen to my voice or else I must discipline you because I love you. And he says that if you continually disobey me, if you continually not listen to my voice, that discipline will ratchet up. Just like you with, your, with you and a parent, with your own children. If they disobey, you discipline them. If they disobey more, you discipline more. If you disobey more, they discipline more. And eventually that ratchets up. And God says, I will ratchet it up because I love you. And I will send prophets to speak to you. And I will tell them, turn back to me. You listen to the voice of God, return because God desires to bless you. He wants all of his good purposes for his world to go forward through you. If you will but listen. But if you do not listen, then eventually, eventually, and we're talking over a long period of time because God is slow to anger, eventually I will remove you. I will scatter you and remove my presence from you. Now forward, fast forward through the history of Israel. How does Israel do? Is Israel a faithful spouse? Is, they are not. Is Israel an obedient child? They are not. And so God says, I wanted to bless you, but I cannot. And I've disciplined you over and over and over and over and over again. I've called you back over and over and over and over again. And you will not listen to my voice. So I must do what I promised I would do. I'm scattering you among the nations. And I'm removing my presence from you. And in essence, that's the Old Testament. Now, there's more to it than that, much more to it than that. But it's a story that cries out for an ending. And what that story tells us is that if God's good purposes for the world are going to go forward, God must have an obedient partner. He must have a faithful son. He must have someone who will listen to his voice so that he can bless them and so that the promises and all the purposes of God can go forward. And guess who that is? I have come to fulfill. I have come to complete that story. Jesus is the faithful one. And I want to show you that in the prophets. Jesus says, I came to fulfill the prophets. And if you would, I invite you with me to open up to the prophets and to Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah 50. In Isaiah 50, uh, 40 through 55, there are four songs that are called the servant songs. The most famous is the fourth one which is uh, starting in Isaiah 52 through 53 is where we see he's pierced for our transgressions and he counts the many righteous. But there are three other servant songs. This one is the third. In the beginning of chapter 50, as you turn there, it talks about the faithlessness of Israel. And that because of their sins and because of their transgressions, God has scattered them just as he promised that he would if they refused over and over to listen to him. And in the midst of all of that disobedience 
and waywardness, here comes this individual who in verse 4 it says this, that the Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with the word him who is weary. That this individual, when this individual speaks, he speaks life. He says, morning by morning he awakens, he awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord has opened my ear. Now remember, what is the Hebrew word for obey? Listen. And this individual has their ears opened by God so that he hears. And what comes as a result of his ears being opened by the Lord? He says in verse 5 that I, unlike Israel, I was not rebellious. And I turned not backward. That where Israel had shown itself unable to be the faithful spouse, where Israel had shown itself unable to be the obedient son, here is an individual who is. And in verse 9, it says, Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? That whoever this individual is has no guilt in him at all. Reminds us of the words of Christ, where in John he says, Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Jesus succeeds where Israel failed. Jesus succeeds where Adam fails. And Jesus succeeds where you and I fail. And because he succeeds, humanity itself is renewed. And I want to show that to you and to show you some of the blessings of that. Again, Jesus says, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. So we want to look in the prophets. Where is it that Jesus shows us that I am fulfilling this? And I want to begin, if you would, with me, look in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37. It's Ezekiel 37, by the way, where Ezekiel is taken uh, by the Lord to see a valley of death. We call the valley of dry bones. But later on in that chapter, we have this tremendous promise. And in verse 26, we read this, that I, the Lord, this is the Lord speaking, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. Now, here's a question. Now, that word covenant, I'm using that very similar to the word partnership, relationship, that God is going to enter into a partnership and a relationship with us. How is it possible for that covenant to be everlasting? How is it even possible? Have you ever read the Old Testament and you read stories of the Israelites about all their grumbling and complaining, about all their idolatry and backwardness, if you've ever read those stories and you think, those Israelites are really dumb. <laughs> if I was one of those Israelites, I would never fill in the blank. I would never grumble or complain like that. I would never disobey the Lord like that. I'd never be an idolater like them. But if you take an honest stock of yourself, just for one day, and at the end of the day, reflect on the day you just had. Honestly, what you will find is you're not that different from them. You're very much, and I am very much like them. So how is it that God can enter into an everlasting covenant with you? Because you can't keep it. Israel couldn't keep it. And neither can you, and neither can I. The only way that this partnership, this relationship and covenant can be everlasting is because somebody already did it. 
It's the only way it can be everlasting. And that is why it is called a covenant of peace. It's a covenant of shalom and wholeness of restoration because of what Jesus has already done. Let's look further, this time in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah's back a little bit. Jeremiah 31. A very, very famous passage, Jeremiah 31, these these verses. In fact, they are quoted in their entirety in the book of Hebrews. So it's a very important passage to the New Testament apostles and writers. And in verse 21, we read this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. I will enter into a new partnership so that my good purposes will go forward with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Now, why is it not like that one? It says here, that they broke that covenant. My covenant that they broke, although I was their husband. Remember, this is seen as a marriage. Although I was my husband, it's not going to be like that one because they broke it. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Two things and we close. One, Jesus has done what you cannot. You cannot keep covenant with God. You just... Let's just, you know, look, I can't do it. You can't either. But Jesus did. And because he did, think about what happened when Abraham obeyed in one moment. When when Abraham obeyed in that moment when he said, I'm going to take Isaac up, it was like this epicenter of blessing that comes when Abraham listened to the voice of the Lord in that one episode. It's, I'm going to bless the world through you because of what you've done. If that much blessing flows from that act of obedience in Abraham, imagine the blessing that flows from the life of the faithfulness of Jesus. That's like an asteroid coming from heaven to earth. It shatters the world. That kind of blessing. And we are united to him in his faithfulness by the work of the Holy Spirit. You are saved not because of your faithfulness. You are not faithful. I don't mean to want to tell you that. You are not faithful, and neither am I. Jesus is faithful, and we are saved by his faithfulness, and we rest and trust in his faithfulness. Now, does that mean that you can go from here on and do whatever it is that you want? Can you just go, oh, well, I'm saved by Jesus' faithfulness. I guess I can party like it's 1999. You cannot. Because the promise blessing that you have received, now this is interesting, the promise blessing that you have received because of the faithfulness of Jesus is a new heart. When you have faith in him, you have a new heart. But what is written on that heart? The law. Isn't that interesting? What's written on your new heart in Christ? The law. Have you ever wondered why, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus opens up his sermon pronouncing blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing? He pronounces that you are the light of the world. You are the city on the hill. These are the promises of the restored Jerusalem being pronounced over these people. And then the next thing he does is exegete the law. Have you ever wondered, what a weird thing to do? 
Why do you transition from the blessings of the new Jerusalem being pronounced over a people to exegeting the law? The reason is, is because the blessing of being the restored Jerusalem is a new heart. And what is written on the heart? The law. It makes perfect sense that Jesus transitions from the blessing of being in the new covenant to exegeting the law because that is what's written on our hearts. And so in these coming weeks, what we're going to be doing together is to ask the question, what does it mean to follow God from the heart? Because that's exactly what Jesus says is written on our hearts, is the law. But as we do that, and this is final thought, we close. As we follow God from our heart, and we're going to see in the coming weeks, that is intense work. As we talk about what it means to follow Christ from the heart, we do so resting and trusting in His finished work. Because whenever we follow God from the heart, what you're going to find is you're going to mess up. But praise be to God. He has finished it. We rest in Him. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus did not set aside the work that you began all the way back in creation, that you have made us to be your partner, that through us your good purposes for the world would go forward. And Lord, thank you that although we are faithless, Israel was faithless and wayward and backward, that you are not faithless and that you sent your only begotten Son, that he fulfills all righteousness and because of his obedience, even to death on the cross, his righteousness clothes us and gives us new hearts And we pray that in the coming weeks, Lord, that you would help teach us about what it means to follow you from the heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.